I'd like to talk about uh, evolution of the whales and a little bit about um, diving in, in whales. Uh, to do that, we have to understand a little bit of the history of the group. Um, it's sort of an interesting history, uh, and it's one that we don't fully understand. Um, we, what we know um, fundamentally is that whales probably originated uh, sometime in the Paleocene uh, and then differentiated in the uh, early Eocene. And there are two questions uh, that come to mind immediately. Uh, and the first is, uh, from which mammalian groups did the cetaceans evolve? Uh, and then secondly, um, do the two modern suborders of whales have a common ancestor or not? Uh, right now, we break the whales down into two groups, uh, the odontocetes and the mysticetes. Uh, the odontocetes, as the name implies, are toothed whales. Uh, the mysticetes are the baleen whales. Uh, what you see on the image here um, is a baleen whale. Um, so the fossil material that we have uh, dates back to the Eocene uh, of Pakistan and belongs to an order or a suborder uh, known as the Archaeocetes. Uh, the Archaeocetes are long since extinct. Uh, and I suppose the question is, um, do the archaeocetes give rise to both baleen and toothed whales, or are the baleen and toothed whales uh, somehow separate? Uh, there are other early fossils that we have uh, from the Middle Eocene of Egypt and Nigeria, um, and those fossils are all members of that suborder archaeocetes, uh, and we oftentimes refer to them as, uh, as zoiglodont. Um, and uh, you can see an image of zoiglodont right here. Uh, here, too, actually, in this image, uh, there are two fossils. Uh, the one on the bottom is uh, zoiglodont, uh, and the one on the top is basilosaurus. Uh, and when you look at these two fossils, there are a couple of things uh, to pay attention to. One is to notice the, um, the hips. Uh, so in zoiglodont, on the bottom, uh, there is sort of a fragmentary hip uh, there. Um, for Bacillosaurus, it's a little more pronounced, um, but in both, it's uh, fairly reduced. Now, Zoiglodon seems to have a much greater elongation of the skeleton um, and uh, than does Bacillosaurus, um, but they both have, uh, you can tell by looking at them, that they are both somehow um, adapted to some kind of an aquatic lifestyle. Now, when you look at the skulls, uh, the other thing to pay attention to is the shapes of the skulls, uh, and both of these forms obviously have teeth rather than baleen, so clearly the first, um, the first whales were um, toothed whales of one variety or another. Um, but the, the skulls are fusiform, uh, which implies that they would be uh, well adapted to moving through water. Now, both of these fossils uh, were associated with, um, with shallow seas, uh, and it turns out, if you, if you look at the maps from where these fossils were found, Pakistan, Nigeria, uh, and Egypt, and so on, um, that these were all roughly in the same general area. Uh, and it turns out that if you um, look at the um, historical geology of the area, at one time where the Mediterranean is now, there was a large uh, shallow sea referred to as the Tethys Sea. Um, so that uh, is roughly where the Mediterranean uh, Sea is now and the Persian Gulf and so on. Um, so it's a large shallow sea um, and that's where we find these animals. And that provides a clue as to the origin of, of uh, the cetaceans. One thing to think about is uh, which group of mammals gave rise to the cetaceans. And uh, there we, it's, it seems most productive to take sort of a stochastic point of view. Uh, so evolution is a uh, rare event, uh, not that allele frequencies don't change, right? They do, and they change all the time, uh, but actual speciation is a relatively rare event. Uh, and what that means, it's just like buying lottery tickets. Uh, the more lottery tickets you buy, uh, the better your chances of winning. If you buy two lottery tickets instead of one, you've doubled your chance of winning. Now, the chance of winning, regardless, right, is going to still be exceedingly um, small. Uh, and that's the case here, too. Uh, so one thing we should look for when we're looking for an ancestral group uh, to the cetaceans is, 
is simply uh, who were the most abundant groups um, at the time that would have been located uh, in this area. A logical um, group to have given rise to the cetaceans would have been the condylarthrans. Uh, now there is a, a problem associated with this, um, and that is that the condylarthrans are sort of a garbage basket uh, evolutionarily. Uh, so for the longest time, uh, there were all these fossil mammals and people, uh, scientists couldn't figure out exactly what they were, where they belonged and so on. Uh, and this group was created, and at the time it was thought to be a, a, a formal or a, a cohesive kind of a um, taxonomic group. And it was referred to as the Condylarthra, and all of these organisms with certain sort of morphological attributes were placed in this, in this basket and referred to as the Condylarthra. Uh, we know now that it's not a natural group. Uh, what we do know, though, um, is that from this garbage basket group, uh, there were lots of organisms that um, that descended, including the ungulates, so the artiodactyls and the perissodactyls, uh, so the deer um, and the antelope and and the horses, right, the even-toed and the odd-toed um, ungulates, um, but also uh, the cetaceans are known to have uh, derived from some members of this group. So what we do know is that there is um, a link, a some kind of close similarity uh, between the ungulates and uh, between the cetaceans. And now the question becomes, if, if the cetaceans, if the whales are related to the ungulates, uh, to which group are they most closely related? Would it be the perissodactyla, um, the odd-toed ungulates, or the artiodactyla, uh, the even-toed ungulates? Now, at the time, right in the early Eocene, uh, the ungulates that would have been um, had the greatest species diversity uh, and therefore the greatest genetic diversity would have been the perissodactyla. Uh, so there were, there were many more species of perissodactyls um, in the Eocene than there were artiodactyls. Uh, that has flipped uh, over the last 70 million years or so. Now there are many more species of artiodactyls than there are perissodactyls. Uh, the perissodactyls are the horses, tapirs, and rhinos. Um, so that's not a very uh, rich, diverse group. The artiodactyls, on the other hand, are uh, essentially all of the other ungulates, all right? not excluding the subungulates, uh, things like uh, elephants and so on. Uh, so uh, it seems, uh, stochastically at least, that... Um, there is a link between the perissodactyls and, and the cetaceans, and that would have happened on uh, somewhere on the shores of this Tethys Sea. Now, in all honesty, if you look at the genetic evidence or you look at the serological evidence, you know, based on blood chemistry and so on, uh, it seems that there, the relationship between uh, the cetaceans and the artiodactyl seems to be somewhat stronger, but that whole uh, question has not yet been resolved. When the giant supercontinent of Gondwana began to separate, a new seaway was created which separated the northern continents, such as Europe and Asia, from the southern continents, such as Africa, Australia, but also India, which had not yet fused to Southeast Asia. This was known as the Tethys Seaway. Uh, the Sahara Desert uh, was underwater and formed part of this um, uh, Tethys Seaway. And when the Age of Mammals began, this Tethys Seaway uh, was located near the equator. And so this was a very important area for the origin of the whales. Uh, the earliest whales are known only from the area around the Tethys, such as North Africa and Pakistan. 15 million years ago, the tethers began to close as India uh, fused uh, with Pakistan, creating the Himalaya Mountains. And remnants of the tethers seaway include the Mediterranean Sea, the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, and the Aral Sea. This once giant seaway separating the northern and southern continents uh, was the site of much of the early evolution of the first whales.
So let's think a little bit about the possibility of uh, an ungulate, whether it's a, um, a horse or um, an artiodactyl or whatever. Um, but how that might have looked and why uh, it might have happened that they would have given rise to uh, the cetaceans. Uh, the first thing to uh, keep in mind is that marsh-like habitats are the most productive on the planet. Uh, so there's an enormous amount of um, photosynthesis taking place. They are nutrient rich um, and they are species rich. Uh, so uh, horses and, and perissodactyls in general uh, tend to be grazers uh, and they oftentimes are food limited. Uh, so you can imagine that if uh, you're grazing on the shores of the Tethy Sea, which is already, because it's equatorial, uh, going to be very productive, um, that if they are food limited, uh, there might be an inclination to move into the water uh, and to feed in the water. And here you see an image of a horse, uh, which is feeding right uh, on the edge of the water. Uh, so now imagine what's going to happen if you're, if you're doing that. Uh, the first thing that the first problem you're going to confront is that every time you put your face in the water, your nares are in the water as well. Uh, so what you would expect evolutionarily is that natural selection would favor the movement of those nares. Uh, and in fact, when you look at the fossils of the available fossils of cetaceans that we have, uh, there is this general migration of the nares from being terminal on the front of the snout to uh, moving farther and farther up the snout until the condition that you see in baleen whales, where the, the nares are actually on top of the head. Um, that's referred to as telescoping of the skull, uh, but that's clearly uh, one attribute. Uh, so you can imagine uh, that there would be selective pressure for these animals to move into the, into the water to capture some of the uh, food resources available there, uh, and then uh, that would then put selection pressure on the position of the nares. So let's consider some of the major morphological changes that uh, we know have happened and that we would expect in uh, the evolution of whaleness. Uh, so um, the first thing uh, that we want to pay attention to um, is the dorsal movement of the nares. And we know from the fossil record that that was already uh, underway uh, within the Eocene. Uh, so if you look at the, um, the Paleocene-Eocene border, it is somewhere in there that we know that the Archaeocetes first show up. Uh, and the first thing that happens is streamlining of the body form. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, having a fusiform body makes it possible to move through the water um, with less energy. Uh, and then dorsal movement of the nares. So you can easily imagine an animal like a horse or, I mean, clearly, obviously, uh, an artiodactyl of one form or another, at the very least, some kind of condylarthrin, um, is uh, streamlining the body. The, door, the nares are moving uh, farther up on the rostrum. Um, and then, ultimately, the limbs are uh, going to become webbed or adapted to swimming in water. So as the animal abandons land altogether and moves uh, fully into the water, uh, you can ultimately uh, imagine development of flutes. Uh, so in fishes, the caudal fin is uh, perpendicular. Obviously, in mammals, it's going to be horizontal. Uh, and that's because fishes use lateral undulation for locomotion. Uh, mammals, we don't have that ability. We have dorsal ventral uh, flexion. Uh, so the, the flukes are going to be horizontal rather than vertical. Um, so then uh, somewhere in there, there's also a modification in the dentition. Now, uh, artiodactyls and, and all ungulates have teeth which are designed for crushing. Uh, and one of the things that you notice in whales is that if whales have teeth, they are conical. Uh, and those are the sorts of teeth you associate with catching fish or uh, some sort of prey item like that. So if you're in the water and you're feeding on something, you're not going to rip it apart and chew on it and things of that sort because obviously you'll lose big pieces of it. Uh, so animals that feed on fish in the water uh, stab their food items so that it can't get away and then swallow it whole. And that's certainly what you see in the, in the toothed whales, like killer whales and dolphins and porpoises and things of that sort. Uh, the other thing that you see, however, is the, is the formation of 
um, baleen. Uh, so baleen is a keratinaceous subs substance. Uh, it's essentially matted hair, right? Um, and the baleen whales develop these large plates that suspend from the upper jaw and are used in filter feeding. Uh, so that divide takes place uh, somewhere in the Oligocene, right? Uh, but there is a tend towards this modern odontocete skull plan uh, by the Eocene-Oligocene border. Um, and it is at that point that we see this divergent after the Oligocene has started that we see this divergent between the skull morphologies, uh, the odontocete skull morphology and the uh, uh, mysticeted skull morphology. And I'll show you images of that in just a moment. Um, one of the things that happens with the, uh, with the whales is that you get this odd shape. On the odontocete whales, uh, the anterior margin of the skull is shaped essentially like a satellite dish. And so there's big, this big depression there. And sitting on top of that is this uh, sack of oil called the melon. Uh, so you have this cranial basin with this depression in the front part of it. Uh, and the nares are coming up right behind that. And the hypothesis is that that's going to be used in the propagation uh, and reception of sound waves. Uh, but from that point onward, we see these basic um, refinements in the morphology of whales. And we see this distinction, right? We have the toothed whales and the baleen whales. Somewhere in the Oligocene, there is that, that divide between these two groups, or alternatively, Whaleness has evolved three times, right? Once as, uh, uh, once as the archaeocetes, a second time as the toothed whales, the odontocetes, and a third time as the baleen whales. It, it, that simply seems to be unlikely uh, in light of how we think evolution works. Here you can see the depression in the skull of uh, this odontocete uh, whale. Uh, another thing that I would like to point out as you're looking down uh, onto the dorsal surface of this skull uh, is that the skull is asymmetric, uh, so the nares are not positioned perfectly uh, midline. Uh, they're offset a little bit, uh, and that's true for all odontocete uh, whales. Uh, there is this asymmetry in the skull, and the obvious question is, why would that be? Um, the leading hypothesis is that that's essential for um, the sort of echo, the sound production uh, technique that they use. Uh, the other thing to note as you look at this image uh, is this telescoping of the skull. Uh, and you see here um, at the top is a horse, Bacillosaurus, and then um, a couple of other whales. Notice what happens to the position of uh, the nares. So on the horse, they're anterior, and Bacillosaurus, they've already begun to migrate um, uh, towards the top of the skull, and then in, in, the, in the toothed whales and whatnot, and in the baleen whales, they are uh, absolutely at the top of the skull. Uh, so clearly, uh, the farther back the nares are, the, the farther you can get your mouth into the water if you're feeding in a marsh or something like that, uh, and still breathe while you're trying to eat. So it's going to improve foraging efficiency. Uh, now, uh, when we look at the um, skulls, or rather at the skeletons of baleen and toothed whales, there is uh, another fundamental uh, difference that you see, and that happens in the shape of the skulls. Uh, so the upper uh, diagram here is for a baleen whale, and the lower diagram is for a toothed whale. Um, so the baleen whale, uh, this nice arched um, skull, uh, is going to suspend the baleen plates that are then going to be used in filter feeding. Uh, and uh, notice, uh, importantly, uh, how this skull is set up. So it's arched like that. Uh, imagine what's going to happen when this animal opens its mouth. Uh, this is a big animal with a lot of mass. So you can imagine as this animal is moving through the water uh, with the kind of mass that it has, uh, the forces operating on that skull are going to be enormous. Uh, so uh, if that jaw is opened and it's moving through the water, uh, that jaw is essentially going to be ripped right back. Um, and in order to prevent that, uh, what happens in gray whales is they have something referred to as a mandibular stay. Uh, so when the mouth is opened, the range of motion is severely limited. Uh, there is this strut at the back of the skull, and you can't really see that in this diagram, but there is this strut back there uh, 
which is going to prevent that thing uh, from opening any further. The other thing to pay attention to, and you saw that on the initial image of the humpback whale, are these grooves that are on the throat. Uh, so when this animal opens its mouth, that water is going to flood into the mouth and the throat cavity is going to expand enormously. The mouth is then going to begin to close and those muscles are going to contract and force all of that liquid back out. So the liquid is shooting past the baleen plates and of course all of the krill are going to be trapped behind the baleen plates. If you look at the skull of the toothed whale, notice that it's not arched, right? This is an animal that's going to be feeding on fish and things of that sort. So it, it has a fundamentally different approach to feeding. One additional uh, morphological change that I'd like to point out just very briefly, uh, and I, we may have talked about this once before, but it's compression of the cervical vertebrae. Uh, these animals, uh, as they're swimming through the water, uh, neck mobility is not a good thing. Uh, turning your head to one side is certainly going to uh, increase profile drag uh, and therefore increase the cost of uh, transportation. Uh, and potentially result in a serious neck injury. Uh, so what's happened in all whales is that the cervical vertebra have become compressed. And as you can see on the right here, they are essentially just a stack of plates uh, so that there is no motion in that head. Uh, whales are not looking side to side, and that's clearly uh, an adaptation to um, reducing head mobility. Uh, there's still a great deal more uh, I'd like to talk about, but I would like to keep this as short as I possibly can. Um, if you're interested in uh, whale evolution and so on, there are lots of resources available. Uh, and of course, you could always take mammalogy, uh, in which course we go into considerable detail in the evolution of whales. Um, but let's uh, switch gears now and talk about diving adaptations. Uh, so uh, whales clearly um, are able to dive extensively, uh, and it's sort of a puzzle um, how they're able to do that. Uh, let's begin by just talking about some of the basic um, abilities of different mammals. So how long can a mammal hold his breath or how long can a, can a mammal dive? Uh, well, humans can dive for about two and a half minutes. Now, I know that the Japanese pearl divers can go a little bit longer than that, but uh, two and a half minutes is uh, about the limit. Um, a white rat uh, can do a little bit better. It can go three, uh, just over three minutes. Uh, beavers can go for 15 minutes. Muskrats can go for 12 minutes. Uh, your pet dog, Fido, can go for about four and a half minutes. Uh, a seal can go for 15 minutes. A gray seal uh, can go for 20 minutes. Elephant seals can go for 30 minutes. Uh, manatees, uh, which are not cetaceans, uh, can go for about 16 minutes. Uh, Weddell's seals can go for 43 minutes. Sperm whales can go for 75 minutes. And bottlenosed whales uh, can go for 120 minutes. That's two hours at a depth of two and a half miles. So just think about the significance of that. That is, they can dive and stay underwater for two hours and dive to a depth of two and a half miles. Now, that raises all sorts of uh, interesting questions. If you've ever um, gone scuba diving, uh, you understand that uh, you don't have to go very deep before you feel the pressure of all that water weighing down on top of you. Um, and uh, you can just think about the um, the forces that are being applied. Uh, when I was a kid, there was a, a nuclear power submarine called the Thresher. It was an experimental submarine that the Navy had. Um, and as a kid, I can remember listening to the radio reports about uh, what had happened to the Thresher. Uh, and it was in, I think it was the Marianas Trench. Uh, and uh, they were testing this submarine. And there was some sort of mechanical problem with the submarine. And they were sending radio signals back to the surface trying to uh, get help and so on. Um, and at some point, they knew that they were doomed. And then you just hear this large grating sound and then all of the all of the radio communication stopped. And what had happened was that the submarine had been crushed by the 
pressure of all this water on top of it. Uh, so that submarine is still at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. Uh, it is not recoverable. It's just simply too deep. So here then are the, the major um, issues. The brain and the heart are going to require oxygen all the time. Uh, so the oxygen that you have with you when you go below the surface is all that you're going to get. Uh, you can't take the air with you. Um, you, you and, and importantly, um, you, when whales dive, they have a fundamentally different response from when you dive. When you dive into the water, you fill your lungs with air um, before you go down. That's not what a whale does. A whale exhales. It evacuates its lungs. And in fact, the ribs on a whale are hinged uh, so that as it dives, its chest cavity is going to collapse. So the ribs are going to fold in on themselves uh, and the entire chest cavity is going to be collapsed. Uh, well, why is that? Well, one reason is that the, the air is going to hold you up and, and push you back up to the surface. Uh, so it's going to be easier to go deep if you don't have lungs full of air. Uh, the second thing is that the air that you have in your lungs is potentially dangerous. And if you've ever gone diving, uh, you know how important it is to return to the surface very slowly. Because if you have lungs full of air and you come to the surface too quickly, you get something called the bends. So all the nitrogen that's in that gas is going to bubble out as you come back to the surface uh, and form these gas bubbles inside your, uh, inside your tissues. And that is, uh, can be fatal. Uh, so what whales do is they uh, they exhale before they go down. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, the only air that they retain is in the trachea. So the trachea have these bony rings. Uh, so it's a residual amount of air and that's it. Now, the, the next problem that uh, you have to confront is that, of course, as you stay down, CO2 levels in the in the blood and in your tissues are going to increase. Uh, and uh, that's going to be an issue. Um, if, when you were a kid, perhaps you got so angry at your parents, you said you were going to um, kill yourself by never taking another breath, right? And, and you storm off and you just grab a chest full of air and just hold your breath. Uh, there comes a point at which no matter how hard you try, you can't do anything about it. You're going to gasp for breath, right? It's simply a consequence of the vagus nerve responding to those CO2 levels. So um, what whales have to do then is they have to suppress that. One of the things that whales do is they uh, have something called bradycardia. Uh, so they slow down the heart rate. Next, they have a, a Reedy Mirabile system, uh, which surrounds the spinal cord and the vertebral column, uh, so that when they dive, blood is shunted away from the periphery of the body, and it's shunted into that Reedy Mirabile uh, surrounding the spinal cord. So that means that all the oxygen that's um, now available uh, is going to be provided to the spinal cord, to the heart, and to the brain. So the key structures are provided with oxygen. Everything else is going to be starved of oxygen. Uh, the next thing that happens is that uh, whales um, have an extensive quantity of myoglobin, certainly much more than, uh, than we have. And myoglobin is another protein which is capable of holding uh, onto oxygen. Uh, they are capable of tolerating um, high levels of lactic acid, so they're able to tolerate a high oxygen debt. Uh, they vasoconstrict uh, and forcing all that blood into the Reedy Mirabile system. Uh, they exhale before they dive. Um, typically, a whale's lungs can hold 100,000 liters. Um, after they've exhaled, there's going to be a residual 10,000 liters of gas that's in the trachea, and that's all. The trachea are reinforced with these cartilaginous um, bony rings uh, that will prevent the trachea from collapsing. The lungs are going to collapse. Uh, in sperm whales, there is no sternum uh, so that the, the ribs actually pivot on their articulations. Uh, and the chest then is going to look uh, horribly disfigured and collapsed. Its whole anatomy is designed for diving for long periods. <laughs> 
With each breath, we humans replace only 15% of the air in our lungs, while sperm whales are able to renew 90% of their breath. Its muscles are rich in oxygen-carrying proteins and can store 10 times more oxygen than humans. As soon as it leaves the surface of the water, the sperm whale's metabolism slows down to save oxygen and its blood is concentrated on vital organs like the heart and its enormous brain, the largest in the animal kingdom. Its chest cavity is flexible, so it doesn't snap when the pressure mounts. Its huge head, a third of its body length, contains a yellowish wax called spermaceti. It is believed that whales can vary the density of this substance at will. By restricting the blood supply, the spermaceti solidifies, acting like a weight, and allowing the whale to dive deeper and with less effort. When it resurfaces, the sperm whale reheats its spermaceti, causing it to liquefy until it is lighter than water. To avoid decompression accidents in the bends, the whale is able to collapse its lungs while still sending oxygen to the brain. So the sperm whale can stay underwater for up to two hours. Blue whales are the largest animals to have ever existed. As long as about three school buses and as heavy as 15, blue whales even outsize the dinosaurs. The whale's marine habitat contributes to their exceptional size. The ocean provides more room to grow and eliminates one of the factors that usually hinder animal size. Gravity. Gravity limits the size of land animals to what their skeletons can support. The ocean's buoyancy spares marine mammals of this limitation, thereby allowing them to grow unlike any other animal. Blue whales have one of the loudest calls in the animal kingdom. Measuring up to 188 decibels, their song can be loud enough to overpower the sounds of jackhammers and jet engines. The whales use their powerful songs to communicate with each other, oftentimes from long distances. These vocalizations, which are deep moans and rhythmic low-frequency pulses, have been recorded from over 500 miles away. A blue whale's age can be determined by its earwax. About every six months, a new layer of earwax forms inside a whale's ear canal. The wax primarily serves to protect the ear canal and helps carry sound waves into the whale's inner ear. However, this buildup of wax layers, called an earplug, can be measured and used to estimate a whale's age, much like counting the rings in a tree trunk. The average lifespan of a blue whale is about 80 to 90 years, but the oldest one found, based on its waxy earplug count, was about 110 years old. Blue whales can eat four tons of food a day. That's more than an African elephant weighs. Despite the whale's enormous size, their diet primarily consists of tiny crustaceans called krill. The whales use their pouch-like lower jaws to scoop up swarms of thousands of krill floating in the water. The whales then push the water out of their mouths and through baleen bristles lining their upper jaws. The bristles are thin enough to let water through, but thick enough to catch krill. Whale baleen was often used in 19th century fashion inaccurately referred to as whalebone, whale baleen is instead made of keratin, the same strong, flexible material found in fingernails. Keratin allowed baleen to become an ideal material for structuring clothes, 
such as corsets, collars, hat brims, and hooped frames in skirts. Because of the high commercial value of baleen and other whale body parts, blue whales were nearly exterminated. Today, thankfully, global bans on whaling were put in place, allowing the species to slowly rebound. Thank you.